Hello, welcome to Beacon Hill Update. I'm Chris Collins in the Frontier Community Access Television Studios for part two of my interview with Senate President Stan Rosenberg. We covered a lot of topics in the first interview, and I want to get to the one that I think a lot of people probably tuned into the show for, and that, of course, is the proposed natural gas pipeline. Now, there was yeah. a ruling recently. There's a, 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 a civil suit that's been filed by some plaintiffs from uh, largely from the West County, or the South County area, um, basically challenging the ability of Kinder Morgan and Tennessee Gas to take property by eminent domain for this pipeline. And it's been ruled that it can't be heard in federal court, has to go to appellate court. So it, that may be the best chance to stop this thing, but what have you heard on this project? What's the latest that we don't know? So let's see, where are we? Um, the latest that we don't know. Uh, they've, they've filed for the certificate, which is the, the, the next phase and really the biggest phase of this approval process. FERC does have roughly 90%, if not more, of the power in the situation. And um, the process, as I understand it from my visit with FERC, uh, went down there in December, uh, is that if both the pipeline that's being proposed in eastern Massachusetts and the NED pipeline crossing western central into Dracut, then uh, if they're both on the table at the same time, that they will consider both of them at the same time. So it's uh, very much in the interest of Western Massachusetts for both of those to be on the table at the same time because the message that I came away with from Washington was everywhere I went, Department of Energy, FERC, uh, some congressmen's offices, that the prevailing view in Washington is that the New England area is gas constrained and that is contributing dramatically to the high cost of energy, which has impact on everything from personal budgets to institutional budgets to business budgets to the health and strength of the economy. So um, this next phase is the uh, FERC uh, considering everything that was submitted, which was incomplete, as you may recall, yeah. and they've asked for a lot of additional information. That is to be expected. Proposals are rarely submitted, quote, complete, and so a lot of holes have to be filled. I think the situation here in Massachusetts, the one unique circumstance that we have is that we have Article 97 in the Constitution yeah. that does not allow for public lands to be taken uh, without a two-thirds vote of, e of both the House and the Senate in order to take it out of conservation. When I asked FERC about that, they gave me a kind of blank stare because they had never heard of it, number one. And number Wait a two, minute, they didn't know about Article 97? They did not know about Article 97, <laughs> and no other state has that particular type of provision embedded in the Constitution. They have state laws in some cases which have to be followed, but it's different when it's in the Constitution. So um, that is going to be a potential uh, that's going to be a big show because from all the research we've done, no pipeline that has been approved by FERC that the licensee wanted to build has ever not been built as a result of local or state challenge. Every court case has upheld the right of the pipeline to move forward after FERC has given it approval. So, but none of those, none of those has ever had to pass Article 97. So if the legislature fails to give permission for the land to be taken, and then the company chooses to take it by eminent domain, you would expect that there are gonna be court challenges around think. Article 97, and that will be a huge uh, moment in this whole debate. And it's sort of the final moment because it's constitutionally based, and it could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm not a, a constitutional lawyer, neither, neither are you. Correct. But it sounds like that this could be, is, it's possible if this goes badly for Massachusetts that the Supreme Court could overrule a constitutional provision, which is unprecedented, I believe. I, I can't speak to unprecedented, but it would be huge. It would be huge because that's the last stop on the train. I mean, you're talking about ch basically challenging the doctrine of states' rights at the federal mm -hmm. level. It doesn't get yeah. much bigger than that. It doesn't in terms get much bigger. And now let's put this in the context of our current debate, where 
uh, Justice Scalia passed, yeah. and now we have a potential deadlock in the court, four oh. to four. Now what happens? That said, this is uh, probably 12 to 18 months away, and so there presumably will be a new president. We don't know whether President Obama, we know there'll be a new president. We don't know whether President Obama will get his way and install a new justice with the help of the United States Senate or whether it'll wait for the next president. So, but by the time this goes to court, it's likely we'll have a full court and uh, either Mr. Obama will appoint or the next president will appoint. And isn't that gonna be interesting that this decision could hang in the balance of which of them gets to appoint and what type of person that they appoint. But we have another 12 to 18 months. And as I say, I just want to go back to that first point because I don't think it's well known around here, which is that if both the pipeline that's proposed for Eastern Mass, which is along an existing right of way, and it's just making it bigger, if that one is on the table at the same time as the uh, Kinder Morgan pipeline, it could change the conversation. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Is it, is it possible FERC could just say, look, we'll just do the Eastern Mass Correct. pipeline? That is possible. And, and, and not even bother with Article 97. Totally possible. Because there are people standing, I've been to a number of town meetings where this has come up with, there are people who have stood up in town meeting floor and said, we know this isn't going to happen. And I hear that and I kind of shudder like, well, you know, maybe it's not going to happen. I mean, but people seem very, very confident that don't worry, it's not going to happen. And, and I look at the players, I look at the money interest, I look at the politicians, I look at the fact that FERC has never said no to a pipeline, and I think you probably don't want to put all your eggs in one basket on that. So that's, ha that's having a very big sense of faith. That said, we know in our society that it's harder to move to yes than it is to no when you're talking about building something. That said, what's different in this situation is FERC holds enormous power, yeah. enormous power, and it's an appointed board. It's not an elected board, so they're not accountable to the political establishment. They're accountable to the statute that governs them, and the statute that governs them says your job is to figure out do we need the infrastructure in order to make uh, provide the energy that is needed in that region, and do you have an option that minimizes damage and impact to the environment. Now we're back to east versus west, right? right? Always. And um, can you minimize uh, local, uh, can you address the maximum number of local uh, op uh, points of local opposition and concern? And uh, that's, the, that's the third one. It's not the first one, it's the third one. Um, so, you know, this is going to, this is going to keep uh, churning for a while. So. You know, stay tuned. This is another probably 18 months, but um, we, we're learning more and more as we go along, and we're engaging more and more people who are smart about these things. But just remember, we have an ace in the hole. The question is, do we get to play the ace, and can the ace trump the cards that FERC holds? Well, when Kinder Morgan switched the, the route of the pipeline through southern New Hampshire, it was obvious that they, they knew that Article 97 was in play. I can't believe FERC did. I, I'm still blown away. But all by you that. need is one Article 97 piece of land. Just one. Just yeah. one. Because unless you can go around it, and they have many more than one, let me tell you, even on the most recent plan. Yeah. And they'll probably keep trying to find ways to reduce, reduce, reduce. But remember, even in Sandusfield right now, they're still trying to build that one in, uh, in Connecticut. Yeah. It runs through one Massachusetts town, through one piece of property. Article 97, and if the state doesn't give permission for that, that may be where the Supreme Court comes in and tests what happens. A two-thirds majority is not an easy threshold to get, but have you guys done a head count? Have you talked to people? No, but the, the affected communities and their legislators, it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's prepared to vote for, for it. Interesting. And so, the good news is it only takes a third of the members to block, <laughs> not two thirds to block. So it's, you know. Politically, you've taken some heat for not being more aggressive in your opposition. I think, you know, Steve Kulik <clears throat> has been very aggressive. I think most members of the delegation have basically, you know, 
throwing a lot of red meat to their constituents on this issue, and you've been relatively middle of the road. Obviously, you're in a different situation because you're the Senate president. You can't really throw in as heavily as you would like to, but I, I know you have strong feelings about this project and the impact it would have on your district. So you want to clarify your position a little bit? So I, I like, every, like most other people, would prefer not to have a pipeline running through western Massachusetts for a bunch of reasons, including the environmental concerns and uh, public health and safety concerns, but also because, you know, pipelines live a long time. <laughs> yeah. And we're trying to transition to a green energy future. And the smart people say we can do this in 15 to 30 years. And the smartest people and the most hopeful people are closer to 15. The more cautious people are closer to 30. But the pipeline will last 70, 80 years. And so I'm concerned also about the chilling effect that it could have on moving in the direction of green technology. So I, I'm where people, where a lot of people are here, and probably most people, which is I'd rather not have this thing running through Western Massachusetts. That said, as you point out, I'm in a different position, and so I can play a different role that virtually nobody else can play in this. I mean, I, I got a face-to-face -face meeting with the chairman of FERC. I got a face-to-face -face meeting with uh, Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. I got a face-to-face -face meeting with the person who handles the Northeast region uh, at FERC, and I got to sit down and, and discuss this and collect information that nobody else in this discussion has been able to get. So we all play our role based on you know, what, what, where we sit, what we can do. And uh, you know, I've always been a, a guy who focuses on the homework and the policy. I'm not, I'm not out there you know, throwing bombs. I'm not out there looking for headlines. I'm trying to do my job and, and get it done as well as possible and make a contribution to the best outcome for Massachusetts. We are gas constrained, our energy prices are out of control, and we do need to have a green energy future. I sit in a seat where I can help work on all three of those major goals at the same time. But it makes it tough when it's such an emotional issue. And, Absolutely. And, I have friends who are very mad at me. <laughs> I have friends who are like, how can, you're letting us down, you're letting us down. Well, uh, my attitude is let's see how this all plays out and at the end of the game, let's see where we are. One last thing on gas because I think it's important, you know, there's a, a moratorium in place and lots of communities, economic development futures yeah. hang on the ability. Right for new industry to be able to get an adequate supply of gas to be able to operate. I know that's certainly been the case in Greenfield and other communities farther south have seen this. I mean, you're talking about that whole area, Hatfield, Waitley, Northampton, yeah. I mean, that, that Amherst. whole, Amherst especially. Yeah. I mean, I mean, these are areas that need to be able to continue to build a business tax base. And if they can't get and, and it affects the real estate market too. If you can't get gas capacity, you can't sell a house and I'm across very, the board. Very unhappy with the moratoria in both the case of Columbia Gas and Berkshire. I've met with and talked with both. Columbia Gas is making great progress on a plan so that they can lift the moratorium and that they will have adequate gas to be able to supply their customer base. I got Berkshire Gas to do a study and the study came back. It still says they need the pipeline as the best option because the other options are less satisfactory and too expensive. I'm going to be sitting down with Berkshire Gas very shortly because I still need an answer about what are you going to do if the pipeline doesn't get built because if the pipeline doesn't get built and you still have a moratorium, that is not an acceptable situation. And we need to lift the moratorium at the earliest possible time. Do you have any other solution for short-term relief so you can lift the moratorium? and long-term about what you're gonna do if the pipeline doesn't get built. Because there's two answers. The pipeline gets built, the pipeline doesn't get built. If it doesn't get built, you have responsibility to serve this customer base. Hopefully they're aware of Article 97, more so than the, the FERC is. Absolutely, <laughs> would think. absolutely. Um, let's talk about people's lives, specifically when it comes to income. The income gap is getting wider. Uh, there was recently a study done that indicates that despite efforts to close it, and there's always efforts to close it, especially in the Democratic uh, administration, it's still getting wider. And Boston is the, the, the city with the largest gap between rich and poor in the country. Um, I know that you've taken some steps 
for example, the increasing of the earned income tax credit. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that first. That's something that actually you and the governor agreed upon. Yeah. Actually, I created the first in earned income tax credit in Massachusetts when I was chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. That was uh, close to 18 years ago. Yeah. It hadn't been adjusted for all of those years. Governor Baker, during his campaign as candidate Baker, said we need to increase the income tax credit, and he wanted to double it. And on the day that I was elected Senate president, when I made my comments to the Senate, I said we should join the governor in the goal of increasing the earned income tax credit. The governor filed a bill. The form of it didn't work in terms of how he wanted to pay for it, but he kept his commitment that he was going to advance the discussion. We put a version in the Senate budget. We had to go to the state Supreme Court to determine that, in fact, we were right, that we could use the budget for this purpose because the House had put in a provision that turned it into a money bill and under the Constitution, only the House, between the House and Senate, yep. can start a tax debate. So they started a tax debate by putting in something that had nothing to do with the ITC. We t saw that opening. We put something in on the ITC. Ultimately, the House, the Governor, and the Senate agreed on how to increase it by 50 percent. At the same time, this January, when that kicked in, the minimum wage went up another dollar. Right. Lowest income families in the Commonwealth, working people, because you can't get an earned income tax credit if you're not working, and you can't get an increase in your minimum wage if you're not working. So the typical low income families' income went up $2,000 in January. These are the lowest income people who are out there sweating away two and three jobs to try to support their families, sometimes both parents in minimum wage jobs trying to do that. So, you know. Cheers to all of us here in Massachusetts for doing something to address this. Now there's going to be continuing discussion. How do we do the other half of the increase that the governor and I want to do? Um, when are we going to talk about minimum wage again? Because there's one more increase next January. And then after that, there are no increases because it's not indexed to inflation. Unless the legislature acts, it will be frozen at $11. Is there support to index it to inflation? Uh, it's it's hot, run hot and cold. Some people are in favor of doing it. Some people are not. A lot of people want to do it because they say something is better than nothing. Other people say, wait a minute, if you're locking people in at a sub, uh, at, at basically poverty wages, yeah. in other words, you can't make a living and support your family on $11 an hour, and if you increase it by inflation, you're not making that much more progress. That said, it's typically four or five years between raising the income tax, well, the la I'm sorry, not income tax, uh, raising the minimum wage when, when a multi-year plan ends and the next time the legislature votes on it. Not because it's the law, it's just that's the way it plays out. And there's a gap usually of three to five years before the legislature will take it up again. Is there a possibility we will ever see a $15 minimum wage in Massachusetts or yes. in this country? Yes, absolutely. So? Well, because it, it, the question is, at what rate? Because nobody would have thought we'd have a 10 or $11 minimum wage now if you thought about it 10 years ago. But, you know, the economy grows, the cost of living grows, the standard of living is, is, a, um, uh, um, is affected by the, the, uh, the, what's going on in the economy. And so you, you eventually have to move up. The question is when and by how much. Oregon just did a six-year plan and uh, is going up to just under $15. Like 1450 yeah, $14.50. And then other uh, jurisdictions have asked to do it. The city of Boston wants to do it for their city and just say that everybody in the city has to be paid uh, a minimum wage of X. Uh, I think they're saying $15. But the point is, um, at some point it's going to go up. The question is, will there be a break, a gap between when it hits 11 and we make the next move, or will we work with the business community, come up with a reasonable plan and have it just keep um, growing, uh, growing gradually? There is, uh, there is an impact on both sides, the people who are getting the increase and the businesses that have to pay it whenever it goes up. That said, the studies all show that the economy adapts very quickly to it. And if you do it gradually and it's planned, you can withstand it much better. It doesn't mean that every business is feeling like they're in a position to be able to do it, but it, it is in the nature. This has been around since 1917, I believe it was. And in fact, my 
my predecessor to, to uh, uh, I call him my predecessor, but Calvin Coolidge <laughs> was one of the people who established the minimum wage in Massachusetts, and he was uh, the last Senate president uh, from uh, this district, and that was uh, in 1914-15. Uh, well, I, I know that the argument always is business is going to get harmed by an increase in the minimum wage. But if you look at some of the things that business has to deal with, for example, paid sick leave that, that yeah. just recently passed, um, there, it seems like there's, there are burdens on business. Is there any way to lift some of those burdens, make it easier for businesses to be able to stay solvent? Part of it is the rate of change and giving businesses time to adapt. In the case of the paid sick time, that was done by the public on the ballot. Yeah. And so uh, it is what it is, and the Attorney General worked with the business community to uh, make sure that it was uh, put in place in such a way that businesses would have time to transition. Even though it had to start on July 1st, there needed to be some transition, and so she worked very carefully with them to make sure that that would be done. And by the way, most um, industrial economies around the world uh, have paid sick time, they have paid parenting leave, um, they have minimum wages that are substantially higher than the U.S. So and these are our competitors. So it's not that it can't be done, it's that it's just got to be done uh, carefully. And I, th I think the next, you know, the next thing that's going to happen will be this discussion on how do we phase up on the next increment on minimum wage. And the other piece is parenting leave. 75,000 babies are born a year. Right. And uh, most states and systems that have these, it's, it's not quite pennies a week, but it's not a huge amount of money uh, because 75,000 babies over 6.7 million people, you know. So it's not a huge lift, but it has to be, any of those things have to be done carefully. You recently completed a constitutional convention. You're going back, I think, in April, right, to finish yes. it off? Yeah. Uh, what well, are some of the to things? To take the next step, take we the may next not step. finish it. Okay. What are some of the things that came out of that? So we took up four of the ten items on that day. And by the way, this is the first constitutional convention where there was actually debate in a decade. <laughs> Most of the time, you come in, gavel to re recess, 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 four or five times, yeah. and then you dissolve the convention, not having debated anything. So we actually debated four of the, um, of the uh, of ten things. And numbers one and four were both related to Citizens United. This was the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that gave uh, basically personhood status to corporations, thereby saying that they could spend money in elections and that you actually couldn't limit their speech, therefore you couldn't limit how much money they could give. So, uh, but we can't fix that through the state constitution, so we put those two aside and we passed resolutions in both the House and the Senate asking Congress to please work on fixing this problem with the Supreme Court. The other two, um, we have a rainy day fund. We've had that since about 1988. It's a very important uh, fiscal tool to help us when we're in, in, uh, uh, in a tough economy and revenues, uh, state revenues are down. And so under the current law, it's baked into the budget. The budget is a, is a simple majority vote. They want a two-thirds vote required if you're going to take money out of the rainy day fund, Ooh. even though the budget is a simple majority. Now, that's sort of akin to what local towns do. I mean, to take money out yeah. of a reserve fund, you have to have, I think, a two-thirds majority at a town meeting floor or of the legislative body sitting. So that would be that would be a bit necessarily a bad thing. could be tough to do, though. So that, But that went down at the Oh, uh, so it's not going to happen anyway. And yeah. part of the argument why it went down is because we use that money to help communities during the recession, so although they have a, a, a higher, um, uh, uh, not getting the word, although they have a, a stricter control, yep. um, we're a sort of a safety valve in the same way that the federal government can print money and they don't have a, uh, a, a balanced budget amendment, where in the state we don't print money and we have to balance our budget. So it's the same sort of thing. So we have a little more flexibility at the state level because we're actually using a lot of that money to help communities balance their budgets. So that one went down, and then the other one was whether we should have an independent uh, redistricting commission. So um, this last redistricting, 42 states were taken to court, including every state that had an independent redistricting commission. <laughs> Massachusetts was one of the eight states that did not go to court because the legislature 
did such a good job at redistricting. So the, the question is, if, is it really broken here in Massachusetts? Yeah. And if it's not broken, why do we need to fix it? So is that going to come up for debate again or not? Not this time, yeah. but people file this every hmm. two or three years. So. I bet there were Republicans that filed that. It was Republicans, and uh, uh, it was pretty much a partisan, uh, a partisan line vote. We only have a couple minutes left, Stan Rosenberg. I wanted to ask you, you've been in the job now for a year. Um, is it what you expected it would be? Is, is the job something? Because you've been, I don't know if you've been hoping to get this job for a while, but you've sort of been in the pipeline and the leadership. And I know when you, back when you ran Ways and Means, the thought was maybe you would go up then, and it didn't happen, and Birmingham went up, and then Murray. Um, is this job what you expected? You know, you never know until you get into a job all of the aspects of it, even though you may have been on the, uh, right on the, just on the, on the edge of it, and so you think you've seen and you understand all of it. So I'd say it's 90% of what I expected, but the 10% that you don't expect is always the big surprise. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean, you know, that, uh, that I was unaware completely, but I didn't realize in, in that 10% just how, you know, how much of that governs what you do and you know how much of your time so so um, you know m my schedule every day is has always been quite jammed but now I mean I do 15 minute back-to-back -back meetings six seven hours in a day of that sort of stuff traveling all over the state I knew there'd be some I didn't realize it'd be this much the biggest thing is the amount of time I spend with the media really? and the amount of uh, the engagement with even the when media. they sandbag you outside your office, like the Mass even, Fiscal Alliance. Even when did, they grab yeah. you outside your office, but um, I feel very strongly that the quote fourth estate, the media, uh, are critical. I think it was um, well, I can't remember which person in history, but it was a famous American. I used to say Ben Franklin, but somebody told me it isn't Ben Franklin. Mm -hmm. He said, if I had to choose between a free press and a legislature, I'd choose the free press. I don't think he was dissing the legislature. Yeah. His point was, if you live in a self-governing society, you need information to be able to understand what's going on and to participate knowledgeably and make intelligent votes. And so working with the media, I consider one of the most important parts of my job. It can be challenging sometimes sure. because, you know, there's all kinds of media and they can have all kinds of agendas about uh, what they might have in mind as they're working with you and interviewing you and stuff. So. But uh, the, the extent of the media contact and the depth and sort of all that's involved in that is, is the part that's the most surprising to well, me. Well, I appreciate you making the time to come out here. And I know that uh, it took a while to set it up, but we got it done. And I'm glad you came in. You dispensed quite a bit of information here today, and I appreciate it as Look always. Look forward to doing it again. That's Senate President Stan Rosenberg. Thanks for being here. And that's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.